Well, a wonderful good morning to you, Grenada, Kayaku, Piti, Martinique, the rest of the Eastern Caribbean. It's just about a minute gone past the hour from 9 o'clock. It is Monday, the 6th day of the month of November. And indeed, it's a pleasure being here with you on GBN Television. Television as Chief Set Channel 7, Channel 11. And Channel 20, if you are in cable, for those of you listening radio, we say thanks for being part of the conversation. We also invite those of you listening on social media to, as you say, a wonderful good morning to you. I'm Joseph Cador, and welcome to today's edition of To The Point. Indeed, it's a pleasure being here with you. I hope you are up and about. And if you're probably still in a quandary as to what the week has to offer, here's is what I say. Trouble not yourself. Let's just take today, survive today, deliver, be at your optimum best level today, and we'll see what happens tomorrow. My guest this morning is Dr. Angus Martin. And this morning we'll have a very interesting conversation about the life and times of the man, T.A. Marishaw. Good morning, Doc. How are you? Welcome to the program. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me. Um, pleasure to be here. And it is a pleasure having you. The name T.A. Marishaw is one I think that's known by most households. When we hear we hear the name, we think of our tissue of the, the college. And the conversation in most us in most times that tends to remain right there and doesn't go beyond that. Right. But you as a doctor, as a historian, we tend not to remember the legacy of the man, the father, the politician, the labor the, the man that headed the labor movement, the man that had a dream that the Caribbean should be unified. Why so? Who was that man right. that not much people seem to talk right. about? Well, I think like with, with everything else, we, we tend to recall mostly the superficial um, because we, we only retain a certain amount of information about anyone or anything. So we tend to pick out whatever we, we see necessary to take with us. And I think, and, and in, in credit to Grenada, we have given Marichaud quite a bit of um, recognition. Um, but I think that there is more to be learned from Marichaud, the life that he lived, how he lived, um, how he became, who he became. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's an inspiration to us. I think when we look to how we've gotten to where we are, especially at, we, we're at this point where we're looking at um, our 50th anniversary of independence, how did we get here and what we want to look forward to the next 50 years? Who are the people we're going to emulate? Who are the people that are going to lay the, that we looked at having laid the foundation for Grenada that we're going to put up as symbols of who we want to become? You know, in the future. So I think there really is a lot more that Marichaud can teach us, and I think we need to examine that life and 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 pick things out of it that 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 will benefit us in the future. He was in fact a man that came from, from very noble beginnings. Yes, he actually came very humble. Uh, one would say, like many of our Caribbean leaders, I think, and um, but he was able to pull himself up by the, by the bootstraps, uh, literally. Mm -hmm. I think he graduated primary school. Um, for someone with a primary school, left school at 16 years, mm -hmm. was apprentice um, to a carpenter. So that was what people thought that he could achieve, you know. But luckily for him, he got himself a, a paper as a, a position as a paper delivery boy at a very popular um, newspaper um, by Galway Donovan, mm -hmm. and that changed the course of his life. And I guess just if you take that on the surface, I guess by without with not even considering all of the other things that the other success stories, that by itself shows just that life as it is has nothing very little with right. where you started, but that which you commit yourself to right. achieve. Right. I think there's there's a quote by him. I don't remember the exact words, but to the effect that we are not born into who what we are, you become what you, you want to become. Right. You know, you have control over that. Um, and we've seen that over and over, you know, in our history and across the globe, that you can change the world, but you have to want whatever it is and go about it in such a way that you will achieve. You know, and I think it's, and that's why people like him inspire us because of what they've been able to achieve, despite their upbringing, or one might say because of their upbringing. Right. You know, not despite of it, because that gives him the drive, you know, to want to become something more than what society may have deemed was enough for him. 
I mean, some p folks that listen to the conversation and they're saying, they're hearing us talk about, talking about the things that he has achieved. And they're probably wondering, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. What are some of those right. things that he, he did achieve? Right. As I think a labor move, as part of the labor movement, as a politician, right. everything else. I think to begin with, the, probably the thing he's remembered for the, the most is um, federation. Uh, he's considered the father of federation. Uh, and I think that's probably one of his crowning achievements in terms of and one might say the Federation was a failure, but it, but really, Federation continues in CARICOM today and in right. all other avenues, the OECS. Any of these attempts today to bring the Caribbean together is basically something that Marichaud birthed into existence with Federation and has pushed his advocacy for that unity among Caribbean countries. So I think that is something that he advocated for. And, and like I said, we've had... He, he may have lost the first battle, but the war is still being fought and were proven to be successful in that war because we're still forging ahead in terms of all our educational policies and, you know, CXC. All of those things can be seen as fulfilling Marichaud's dream of Caribbean unity. Mm -hmm. You know, the West Indies cricket team, even though <laughs> may not be doing well at the time. How did you get that, Doc? <laughs> Why did you have to do this to me? <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, these are some of the, the fruits of that endeavor that began, you you know, in the early um, the early 1900s, um, right. that he can be seen, and again, you know, Marichaud should be seen as continuing the dream by William Galway Donovan, correct? Who he learned a lot of that from, because Galway Donovan was one of those that was advocate for. Caribbean unity as well, you know, um, black pride and um, representative government, you know, right. those are some of the things that I think today we talk about independence, 50 years of independence, but Marichaud is the foundation of that for Grenada. Um, but it's interesting that when you hear the conversation, you hear of Sir Eric Matthew Gabriel being the father of independence. Right. And very often, we tend not to f remember those who paved the way right. for him. He was also very a so very outspoken person, spoke oh. a lot against apartheid, what was happening in yeah. South Africa at that time, and all of that helped to develop him into the character that he eventually morphed right. into. I think um, he put out there that he was he wanted to be known as the bulldog. It was his, his mascot, sort of his right. political mascot. But I think that was part of his entire life, him being the bulldog. In, as a newspaper, as a journalist and editor, um, he was in the colonial government's face right. on a daily basis. He held them to count on a daily basis. Um, he was the bulldog champion, you know, at the colonial um, legs, you, would, you might say. Mm -hmm. you know. So I think we need to see Marichaud as not just somebody who came before, but somebody who built a con the, the foundation apart upon which Gary and even uh, Maurice Bishop and those others to come walked upon. You know, that if there was not this foundation, there would be no Gary if there wasn't a Barry show. And, and, as, and as you said, Bishop, Bishop was quite fond of him. Yes. Uh, actually, Marichaud probably got more recognition during the PRG. He had, there was a Marichaud day, um, and Bishop actually have a quote here um, by Maurice Bishop, who said, you know, um, Marichaud showed honesty, courage, and determination, intelligence, and spirited and fundamental um, commitment to struggle. Right. You know, he really embodied for the revolution. I think probably his socialist um, advocacy probably endeared him to the to the PRG. But I mm -hmm. think the PRG, in looking through Grenada's history for individuals who they could um, emulate, which Bishop felt that the qualities of Marichaud's life was mm -hmm. definitely something that Grenadians could emulate. And that's why he was put forward. I think I like to say that every government since independence have unofficially, officially recognized Marichaud as a national hero, even though it was never any legislation or anything. So he right. probably is our first recognizable national hero that everybody seemed to agree on. Um, which is, it's it's not easy in, in Grenadian politics. And even while he did consider himself to be the bulldog, I think, is it possible that that sort of reference is what may have probably forced some people? Maybe not, because it, the bulldog as, as an animal has this natural aggressive, overly aggressive. Right. Right. Some may argue 
misunderstood. Right. And he was, in fact, a dog. He was, in fact, an animal, an, lover. An, an, yes. animal lover. Yes, he was an advocate for animals. You know, I don't, um, I'm not even quite sure he had a bulldog. I know he had a ceramic bulldog right. <laughs> that he said he carried around. <laughs> um, but I think, I think when you look at somebody as my, even though he wanted to be projected, to be seen as a bulldog, he was very gentle. You know, he was um, a singer, sang spirituals, yes. Negro spirituals, you know. So I think um, he was a very funny man. You know, everybody that recounts hanging out with him would talk about, you go to his house and there would be a laugh. You know, he made fun of things. He was very jovial, you know. So I think, like many people, he, he was multifaceted in his personality. Um, but he definitely had certain things in certain areas. You know, when it came to politics, when it came to newspaper, he felt that he was an advocate and he needed to do certain things. You get the sense, though, given um, the period which in which we lived, the, <laughs> that that was a temperament maybe he thought necessary to adapt so so that his voice, people would stop and listen to him. Right. A black man in a white world, quote sure. unquote, for that period. For sure. You had to take on a different persona. For sure. I think a good example would be to look at both him and Donovan. You know, Galway Donovan came before Mary Shaw. Yes. Um, he, Gary Donovan was totally outside the system. He was a newspaper editor. He was even thrown in jail for <laughs> sedition <laughs> against some of the things that he wrote against the, the, the colonial government. Right. He was outside of the system. He was an advocate. Marisha was within the system. Marisha believed that working within the system. Marisha accomplished a great deal. I don't think that anybody could question, you know, what he accomplished from within the system. And he pushed against the system from within the system. He changed the system from within the system. Mm -hmm. And some might question his anti-colonial um, credentials, but I think they would be incorrect in assuming that. And I guess is that very sort of what made him, because he was actually invited to the Queen's coronation in 58. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a legislator. He was within the system. He was given a, a commander of the British Empire. Um, he saw himself as a citizen of the British Empire. What's the lessons to be learned from that, though? That very often we assume that change, and we've seen over the years there have been world leaders who take, mm -hmm. who've taken a different approach right. to breaking the status quo and pushing against the tide. Right. He was one of those. I think you have to recognize what your strengths are. We tend to think that there's a one, one size fits all that you have to be a radical. Actually, Marisha was considered radical yes. um, within the, the representative rebel. government association that they were created, the things he wrote in the newspaper. He was a rebel for his times, but nonetheless, he worked within the system because he felt he could push within the system to change it, and he accomplished a great deal. So I don't think you could really question you know, the choices that he made um, in terms of pushing back against the system. One might, we might want him to be, you know, less of a, uh, what we might term sort of a colonial personality in the sense that he would, he, had, he saw himself as part of empire. Right. Um, even though, like I said, is, is West in, the West Indies must be West Indian, that was a plea for not that the West, Indian the West Indies become only West Indian in that sense, but that it's governed by. And that is something that he pushed, that government officials, even within the colonial system, should be Caribbean people. Grenadian specifically, but he would go for, he was okay with Caribbean people because he felt that that connection between the different islands. Um, and as long as somebody grew up in the Caribbean um, <laughs> and, and had that connection to the, to, the, to the people, that they were the ones who should be um, pushing to, to, to change the Caribbean and, 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 and advocating for people. He was a change for shift in the polit political status quo. And ultimately, and by ex extension, he had a very deep passion for what's happening in the labor movement as well, not just yeah. in Grenada, but across the across region. Across the region. Yeah, we don't think of uh, Marisho as a labor advocate, um, but Marisho really is at the beginning of that for Grenada. Um, in the 1930s, he actually did form, you know, the Working Men's Association mm -hmm. to advocate. He. We tend to, we tend, as we, we view um, Gary as the union person, but again, Gary benefited 
from Mary Show's earlier push. Mary Show was not the man of the people, per se, in the way that we would see Gary. Right. So we tend to not recognize that he was also an advocate for across the region, not just in Grenada, that he would go and support the cause across the region. He was... Um, made the president of the Caribbean Y um, labor union um, organization and things right. like that. So so at the core, he fought for the rights of Grenadian workers in the legislature. That was Marichaud's big push, that he, within the system, he could push back, you know, and he was able to still rally the people. The market square, which is not the market square that back then, was a place where Marichaud would take the struggle, not because in the legislature you could do so much, but he used the market square as well to go promote the cause of the working class and mm -hmm. other issues um, that he wanted to take to the people when he needed the support of the people to make these changes. Looking back, Doc, some would probably told the notion that that's one of the elements that's missing from our local politi or po political landscape where we learn to appreciate because very often has happened in the, mo in the modern trend um, one political organization tends to dismiss that which the other one may have started in that era Marisha built the foundation Gary benefited from it mm -hmm. is that an element you see that that has really strayed far from who we are mm -hmm. as a people i think sometimes we can be a little short-sighted um and and that is because we sometimes don't know a lot of our history and if you don't teach our history in schools you know i remember having a class at sgu uh, intro to caribbean studies and i uh -huh. was talking to these students and i was like how could you not know this and they're like nobody taught us you know, it's like, don't blame us. We did not learn anything about this. Um, and I think there lies the problem. And, and that's why I like the current push for teaching Grenadian history in schools. If we taught Grenadian history, we would be able to recognize that we are on a part of evolution. It may not always be a better evolution sometimes. We right. hope it is. Um, but that we constantly build in pieces of this foundation to take us higher, to become a better nation, to become better Grenadians, whatever that that we define that to be. Um, and I think we have to be constantly looking back because it helps us to get inspiration, to know where we have actually come from, to get to the point where we are today. And if we forget that history, then how could we really say that we are Grenadians and we're building, what are we building? You build and you have to have a foundation. Where is right. that foundation? So we have to constantly re-examine the roads we have taken so we can, say so if you don't reflect personally, you don't know, you don't realize the things you're doing right or wrong and which are the next steps. So I think just as we reflect personally in, in how we build our own character, we mm -hmm. have to do that as a nation. And I think this is a good point to be doing that. As you look at our education system, you can help Many, when they think of history, even parents, even educators, they would ask you, what's the purpose of understanding, wanting to know what happened back then? Right. I tell a little story. Um, I graduated high school in the U.S. And my brother said, yeah, great. Uh, what do you want to study? I said, history. He said, do you want to eat? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, pick something else. <laughs> But but it, it goes to show, I'm, still, I'm doing history now. Right. So despite everything else, I think I recognize that my passion was for history and I could make the greatest contribution in history, mm -hmm. and specifically in Grenadian history, because I always felt I was missing something, you know. So for me, um, I try to impress upon anybody, anywhere, that it is important to at least know your history and to know right. something about it. And sometimes you may not know a lot about it, but at least know where to find things about it. So, yeah, the Internet is great, but the Internet gives you information. How can you start thinking about this stuff? How does it relate? How does Marisha relate to, to Bishop, to Gary? How does Marisha relate to Grenada, the wider Caribbean? And these are the things you're not going to necessarily get from the Internet. It's right. stuff that you get in a classroom, sometimes in discussions. So I think we need to have a better engagement in how we deal with history, you know, looking at the landscape. 
you know, a historical landscape or social landscape and have these interactions that allow us to really fathom the depths of Marisho, where he came from and the, the, the contributions he has made. And it's interesting that you make reference to, to the internet that provides you information, but of course in the context of history it must be contextualized of course. for it to make sense. Of course, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's incorrect. True. I can point out a million of those for you, you know, because again, the internet is cut and paste. So if you see something 50 times, there's doesn't mean that it's correct. It just means that 50 people copied it. You know, um, so I think we need just like we we read a book and we could say, hey, I think this is not correct. This is whatever. Mm -hmm. We need to be discriminating of information. And the internet, I think, we're not we're not taught how to actually um, read the internet. Right. It's the same way that you could read a newspaper and get a certain position not knowing that that's the position of this newspaper continuously it's conservative it's this it's that or whatever it's liberal if you don't know that you will think that this newspaper has been balanced or whatever but i think we need to learn how to discriminate in information as we do for other things we look at the man and we talk about his influence in the labor movement as a politician and in other territories, as we say, as we go ahead towards the 50th anniversary of our independence, and we start thinking about those heroes, in Trinidad, you would have, there is Buzz Butler, a who is in fact a Grenadian, <laughs> and, and you, you say that about the really, yeah, and he's lauded in, 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 yeah. in Trinidad yeah. for the start and live the, the labor the movement. Start and the labor yeah, movement. For sure. There is Gavi, there is Cipriani, all mm -hmm. these other Caribbean leaders, mm -hmm. and they were all contemporaries of that time. Yeah. But in each of these territories, they are glorified. Yes. However, we, we're not there. Um, Why not? That's interesting. I think we've made attempts to do that. I think we have, like, a, one of the things I, I really regret is that we named Tyrrell Street Blaze Street, when that should have been Marichaud's street. Hmm. It's going to be hard to change that at this point. <laughs> but I think we're not thinking. You know, we didn't look at the larger picture. Right. And realize that if we're going to name streets after people, let's look at the appropriateness of it. And you know, it's the reason is because Blaze used to live in a house there when he came from Caracol. Right. Um, that was the only reason. You know, but but again, that is just something that we're not doing what we need to do. We're not actually sitting down and think about how it is that we create our landscape. Right. You know, how do we deal with monuments? For example, we're still looking at the idea of national heroes, officially recognizing national heroes. You know, 50 years into our independence, we cannot say that we have officially accepted who are the people that we've recognized as having given of themselves to build the nation that we are today. So I think, I think we need to really take a deep look at how we imagine you know, our society and where we want, what we want our children to recognize, you know, of our past and to take forward. And I think that's the stuff that we really need to concentrate on if we're going to, to lay the foundations that we could say, we've made these steps and we can build from here. Do you sometimes get the sense as we talk about national heroes that, and you did hint at the fact that we tend to be very myopic in how we view things. So Blaze, because you live there, fine. Yeah. And we don't really, know, we, we don't really want to be knocking on, on, on anybody, but just right. highlight sure. the reality of some, of, some of, mm -hmm. of the folly that we've made. But do you get the sense though that sometimes we want to act, as you look at our heroes, we tend to want to separate history in space and time, take what we want from it, mm -hmm. disregard the, the rest of it, right. when in fact do you think it should be taken holistically, accepted as it is, right. and the lessons that we've learned from it, and the path that it sets us on as we go forward? I like to, to say this. It's, it's, it's meant to be funny, um, so I don't want people to take it in a certain way, but national heroes, we're not creating saints. That's for the church. <laughs> Fair enough. National heroes are human beings that we see certain qualities in, that we want to emulate those qualities. Not everything about that individual. Marisha was criticized for not having married, for having many children outside of wedlock. 17? Yeah, it's a bit, yeah. So, you know, but I don't think we need to see people as human beings, as individuals, as ourselves, the, the mistakes that we make and choices and things like that. We need to 
though we can see them as a whole person, we also need to say these are the qualities that we like about them. The other ones, that's the human side. Let's just move on. You know, we don't have to dwell on it and recognize in that they, are, they did greater things. And those are the things that we emulate them for and we recognize them for. That we can separate those and say, that stuff is really great. This other stuff, it's okay. You know, but we really need to, this stuff is good stuff to build upon. Now that takes us a really, really, really strong sense of maturity. Yeah. Because it is human beings who's now we tend to be very judgmental instead of being objective. Mm -hmm. So a guy may have fallen short. We do not ask ourselves, well, I wonder what were the mitigating circumstances. All we need remember, he was guilty. <laughs> that, and that's all we care about. He was guilty. Instead of thinking, wow, the guy got sent to jail for stealing mangoes to feed his children. Right. History doesn't remember those those particulars. Those details. Those details. All that you remember is that he went to jail. Yeah. No, I think we, we need to take a look. We need to be compassionate when we look at any human. We need to see them within their time as well. You know, I think that's something that we tend to not do. We tend to take people out of these contexts in which they, right. they were born and which they grew. So when you do that, you're already doing them a disservice because you, 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 you're taking them out of what molded them, what created them, you know, good and bad. And, you know, and it's, it's not, like I said, these individuals are people that we see good in. And in, in all of us, there is some good, there's some bad things. We all make mistakes and, and stuff along the way. Right. But we want to, to take these as examples, you know, political examples, literally exa literary examples, that kind of thing, and say, here is a good example for us to follow in, in this aspect of his life. Of course, it was Bojo Banton and one of his favorite songs that reminded us that circumstances, in fact, yes, yes. makes us what we are. Oh, for sure. We are molded by the environment in which we live. You know, it doesn't mean that we can't remove ourselves from it, from certain aspects of it, but we, it's, and, and that's what history does. We said we, we are part of history even as we make it because, and, and the history was, um, there's a meme I think about, um, we, um, I it's really bad that I forgot it, but the, 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 the thing is, that you're human. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember everything, um, but that the fact that, we 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 constantly at the mercy of our history if we don't know it but if we do know it we can transcend it we can use it and i see that for for many things and you know knowing our culture allows us to be creative and take it to another another level we look at trinidad carnival you know they've totally taken folklore and everything and totally transformed it we need to do the same with our history and culture we need to do the same with our history and our culture, so says Dr. Martin. we take a quick commercial break when we come back. We open up the lines and we engage you right here on To The Point for today, the sixth day of the month of November. of Caribbean Passport TV, we travel to St. Kitts and Nevis, visit a cocoa estate in Trinidad and Tobago, and listen to some steel pan music, and then we'll wind down with some paintings right here on this station. I want to control your anger. Diabetes now is so prevalent that if we're not careful, we might be one of the last generations to live longer than our parents and grandparents because it's shortening our lifespan. Learn about prevention, how it is treated and how we can live with diabetes in our communities. Join us on Caribbean Medical TV on this station.
Thank you. Welcome back to the program. 29 minutes on to the hour. My guest this morning, Dr. Angus Martin, and we look at the life and times of Theophilus Albert Mary Show. We've there's so much that we can say, but as you look at the legacy of the man, that he is has gone, and yet while we still he isn't appreciated in in the sphere in the volume that you probably wonder you probably probably should. Mm. We still have the T.A. Marishaw Community College as part of that legacy. His former home, right. the open campus for the university. Mm -hmm. um, do you think if he's where, where he is and he's looking down, he probably would be thinking, I started it and the journey continues? Right. I think um, there was a a little piece that was done by CLR James um, upon when Marisho died and he, he had just seen him earlier on he had seen him within a month or two of his passing and he commented he said um, in a conversation they had um, Tia Marisho talked about two things that he wanted to see live on his house mm -hmm. become a center mm -hmm. um, and, and mm -hmm. that has been accomplished mm -hmm. and the other thing he was concerned about was his collection of writings mm -hmm. his papers we're going to get to that, but before we do, we're going to go to the telephone line. Good morning, caller. You're alive. Good morning, Joseph, and good morning, Dr. Martin. I'm very elated that we are having a conversation on the late team and so today, although tomorrow is his birthday, and I think the seventh. Um, but I've noticed over the last many years, we have paid scant courtesy to this great. Canadian and West Indian. I, for one, in the last two years, have had activity on, on his behalf with two friends of the earth, um, Grenada. But this year, for tactical reasons, we're not having anything. But Dr. Martin, you said something in a, in a production I saw recently about the award. The, the award... The, um, it, uh, it's based on our laws, and nobody pays attention to it. But I would like to get a little history on this. This came about because, again, another organization I was in, St. Mark's Culture Association, which became Grassroots Ecological Citizen Association. We held an, an award ceremony for 30 women and women's organization on, on International Women's Day 1991. And Dr. Dr. Pantel Alexis seemed to be was inspired, and then he went about, I mean, promoting this awards system. And I'm, I'm sorry that uh, we pay, as you said, more attention to the British stuff, to the Empire stuff, than what we could build here. Would you comment on that? Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, I think. Um I think we we do have some legislation actually uh, that dates back a bit um, that recognizes our national um, a more Grenada focused honor system. Um, I think, as you said, unfortunately, we tend to recognize the British um, CBE and MBEs and stuff like that, which um, I think we really need to concentrate on us honoring ourselves and, and that recognition should come from us and not necessarily from outside because I think we've 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 always had that that we don't recognize what's what good we have to offer until somebody outside um, seem to, to 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 first check it and say good and then we're like oh yeah okay um, so I think uh, the idea of our own national um, Honors is something that we need to promote. I think the idea of creating a National Heroes Day, uh, which was designated for October 19th, and I should add that October 19th is not just um, the date of the um, what happened on the Ford, the death of Maurice Bishop, and others, the executions, okay. um, but it's also the, the day that. Um, T.A. Marichaud died. And we use these days to as, as important days because there's the recognition of him and others as well. So I think in, in that, that's a step forward for us in recognizing that National Heroes Day and in designating National Heroes uh, and putting them at the top of our list so that when this day comes around, we will talk about them like we are doing now and continue to do that on a yearly basis at least. Um, but I think more should be done in terms of maybe 
maybe the students at T.A. Marichaux Community College should be able to say who T.A. Marichaux is. What were his contributions if you in an institution that honors him? You know, so I think there's more that we can do, and I am happy that we see some of the stuff is happening, mm -hmm. um, and we need to advocate for more, like you've said, um, in some of the, the things that you've been doing and, and others, that we really need to push the advocacy to the level where that we can get the results that we want. 435-2041, that's the number that is on the inside. Um, we, we Let's talk a go, because we don't want to, because time, it runs so, so quickly. <laughs> but certainly, we want to have some of his works, right. and years after, the legacy mm -hmm. uh, of what it actually represents. I think um, one of the things that I would draw people's attention to is something Marichaud wrote back in 1917. It's called Cycles of C Civilization, and it was a rebuttal to General Smuts from South Africa, who was the the architect of apartheid, the apartheid system in South Africa. So back in 1917, when apartheid was not in existence as we knew it, um, General Smuts went to England and he gave the speech. And Marichaud basically took issue with the speech, the way he uh, characterized black people and black civilizations. And one might say that Marichaud was able to see where Smuts was going with his racist um, characterization of, of black people. And it actually, it's, it's something that he did in a newspaper. It's a, it's a five-part series that he put produced. It eventually became a book, but few people know about it um, in the sense that recognizing his literary um, abilities, you know, his, his, his knowledge of the world when you look at what Marichaud was able, what he wrote about, looking at civilizations across the globe and putting African civilizations within the context, um, that I think that it should be reading for everybody that goes to school at TAMCC, that we should have printed copies. And it was re reissued a number of years ago, and it is available on Amazon, but few people are aware of it. But when you look at the fact that Marichaud graduated primary school, um, at 16 years, and at 34 years, almost um, doubling his, his, his time, that he was able to put this together with knowledge that he gained from reading. That is something we should put up there to admire and, and to promote reading and libraries. I know prior to <laughs> when we were having this previous discussion this morning, we, we spoke of that. And we juxtaposition it to a current education system mm -hmm. where the focus, and I agree wholeheartedly, that the focus should be on us achieving the ultimate. Mm -hmm. But when you look at some of these great leaders, even men that have become success stories, it can it helps to beg the question whether or not somewhere along the way our education system we missed it, a lot of things along the way that the focus right. should not just be on academia right. but on that holistic development that allows us to appreciate who we are right. and our purpose of being here. No, I think you look at Mary Shaw and you just look and said that's a Renaissance man. Right. He educated himself across the board. And that's as a newspaper person, but I think in his whole personal life, he read profusely. That is how he gained his knowledge. And I think that is an example we need to put out there and say, here is somebody with only a primary school education. And look at what he did with, with his life. And look at the things that he wrote about, the things he talked about. He could have gone and this, had discussions with anyone. C.L.R. James, you know, from Trinidad, who is recognized for his literature. Right, right. These are the people that uh, Marichaud, when you look at the organization that Marichaud um, built in Grenada, um, the people that he were with, he led other people. And these people had law degrees. They were solicitors. They were educators. That... Nobody even would think of the fact that Marisha was only a primary school graduate. Nobody, because of what he said and did, because of the things he was able to do, and to, he could hold a conversation with anyone. Nobody would have even questioned that fact. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have an educational system that allow people to become 
Renaissance men and women in the sense that they have a command, a, a well-rounded education, not just a very focused, which we do need some focus because you do need to concentrate. Like, a, you know, I study Grenadian history, but it doesn't stop me from studying Caribbean history, world history, and be able to contextualize everything that, that I know about Grenada. There's some, so there's some that have argued that our education system is not necessarily intended to build us into persons that can appreciate the um, that can appreciate who we are as individuals, but most of it forces us into an already established school of thought mm -hmm. that just allows us just to follow, just to play follow the leader. Right. On on like where it makes us become thinkers, mm -hmm. and so we can be more open to a lot of things. Right. I think our educational system is to graduate a, a, a large group of people to to be to to get a career. Right. and to contribute to nation and for them to survive. I think that's, that is the basic premise, but I think we, we need to move beyond that. We need to be creating citizens who can find happiness in their lives, in the choices that they make, in the careers that they make, but that comes with having a more broad background to be able to recognize, to, to manifest the fullness of who they are. Right. You know, and I think that comes from, we need to be able to say, our, where we come from matters, and that needs to be part of any educational system. Good morning, caller. You're alive. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning to the host and to the guest, Mr. Martin. Uh, very interesting conversation, quite enlightening, Mr. Ma Mr. Martin. I reckon that you would undertake from time to time to come a little more regularly on the radio station to you know, transmit this level of edu um, information relative to our history, etc., and our personalities in history. Very interesting initiative. Something you said there, Mr. Martin, and I'm obligated, therefore, to ask this question, sir. You spoke of our history as, let's put it this way, Caribbean history and individual country history as Grenadian history. And you attention there. But Mr. Martin, this is my question particularly. Don't you think, or would you share my view, sir, that the failure has been that our people have allowed the quote-unquote politicians through demagogues who position themselves as leaders over the years to call the shots to, call it, to make the decisions, re or education system, and not the academics and the people who know about it? Do you think, therefore, sir, that it is its duty of the academics of the country, people who have studied the various things and so on, to pay greater attention to their responsibility in emitting or emanating or divulging or propagating, whatever you wish to call it, this level of historical information to our people instead of allowing it to be in the hands of the politician. I trust my question is understood, sir. And for finally, sir, Mr. Martin, would you have a tell, would you like, would you have a a landline that I'd like to communicate with you on other matters. Do you have a, would you like to divulge a, a landline to me, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, caller. Doc? Um, okay, to address your question, um, I think we, the, the, the role of the politician uh, in government is to create policies. But of course, no policy is made in a vacuum. Uh, policies involve the academics. They involve parents. I think we normally leave parents out of a lot of this. Um, and just ordinary citizens as well who have different um, advocacy that they want to put forward. I think we cannot leave any policy to just politicians or to any one group of people because we are going to get a one-sided uh, outcome. I think in... In looking at education specifically and the way our educational system is set up, uh, one of the problems I see is that we have a Caribbean focus education, which I don't have a problem with specifically, but we also need to figure out how best to incorporate local um, Grenadian history. Because yes, it's good to learn about the, the Maroons, Nanny and, and Kojo in Jamaica, 
But most people don't know that we actually had lots of Maroons in Grenada, you know, Petit Jean and, and folks like that. So I think we also need to figure out ways to, to, to push for our own to have that represented. But, and again, that's where the academics come in. The people who are studying history in Grenada specifically need to start pushing and say, we need to see more. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Philip Dow um, was one of the ones that pushed for revolution to be part of the, the CXC um, curriculum. You know, so I think I think we need to put push other things forward. Um, you know, Fedon's Rebellion. We need to look at Marichaud, you know, as um, one of the ones that that would be with Cipriani and the others, other Caribbean leaders at the time. I think because he did not achieve prime minister status, we tend to think that he might be lesser, when I think that is a mistake, you know, in the way we would see it. So I, I think we definitely need to have more input. We need to have more diverse input when it comes to our education um, system, and we definitely need the research that needs to go into us. Um, and we can big up uh, Dr. Philip Dow for her new book that has been um, used in the secondary schools, Form 1 and Form 2, um, that specifically addresses Caribbean uh, Grenadian history. 452041, that's the number on the inside. We want to say also recognize those of you that's contributing via the um, Facebook platform. Uh, this person says, Good morning, Antonia. I can recall Mary's Bishop in the revolution calling the names of Butler and Mary Show mm -hmm. in every rally. Somewhere in many of his speeches, he always reminds he always reminds us of our history. Yeah, what well, this one is saying, I totally agree uh, that the name sometimes in Karaku of H. Uh, yes, I think he was making reference to what we were talking about, H.A. Blaish, mm -hmm. H.A. Blaish Street. In my opinion, the center of the market square should have been a square with a historical background. Um, and I don't think it's not that the, the historical background isn't there. Right. I don't think we do not, not in much is done to preserve that history. Right, Doc. right. We've, um, I like said, we've built over it. <laughs> yeah. So we've, 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 we've disguised it. Um, the history does not go away. You know, a landscape, I, say, I describe it as, as a palimpsest, you know, where there are layers upon which, and if you dig, if you go digging, you will find it. And that's what it is about research and about, you know, any aspect of how do we explore our history. Um, our history is there. It's not hidden. It's there. If you want to explore it, it requires a little more work. Um, and that's why the historians that are doing stuff on Grenada are putting things out and making people aware. But I think there's also a problem because we don't read as we used to. So if you don't read, you're not going to be getting that new information. You know, so I think, and we need to teach it in schools and, and things like that. So we need to do more um, in looking at our historical, you know. One of the things, uh, you're talking about the market square, one of the things I said, you go to any city in the world, even in the Caribbean, and you walk through the city and you get an idea of the history of that town, of that city. True. You don't get that with St. George's. We have no monuments, very few. We have the Tricentennial Park, uh, which Michael Jessame has been an advocate for. But other than that, we really have no, there's no interpretation. You could walk around the town and you know absolutely nothing about what Grenada has done. And that town has been there since 1740s. St. George's, that town, you know, Ville de Fort Royal, since that period, but there's nothing there that tells of the history of the people and how they created it and, and what they've done. Who do you blame for that, Doc? We can't, we hear conversation, and that might, I don't want us to stray from it. We talk about reparation and the influence of slavery mm -hmm. and how it has helped to shape us and how we think, how we act. Um, do you think very often because we do, is an attempt and escape to get away from the dark side of our history that we've just decided to bury everything and that has become one of the, <laughs> we've now made that error of judgment mm -hmm. that we chat our young people for not knowing not, but as I said, they don't know because nobody said it's, to them. Right. And because we the adults, in an attempt to bury those emotions and that dark side, we've literally, right. if not abandoned who we are. Right. Well, I guess you could, you know, talk about amnesia and, and, and the fact that we just want to forget, but I think the real problem, the issue, we don't have institutions. We did not build institutions. We, today we don't have a national library. 
You know, there is no symbol of the importance of knowledge and reading. We don't have a functioning museum. Um, we don't have these other institutions that really look at heritage and say that this is important. We don't have a national archives. If you want to do research on Grenada, where do you go? You know, where do you go other than the internet? And like I said, the internet has its good points, but it's the internet, you yeah. know. So where do you go? Where are Grenada's records? If I tell you the picture is not pretty, you know, if I, like people have said, oh, I'm doing research and so and so, where I can come to Grenada. I'm just like, don't come to Grenada. I could tell you where to go in France. I could tell you where to go in the UK or the US. Right. Because that's where our records are. That's where our history is kept by others. We've given that or we outsourced it, as a friend says. We've outsourced the, 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 the keeping of our, our history and culture to others, not we have built no institutions to do it ourselves. That is sad, very sad. How could we be independent 50 years and we do not have these basic institutions? Is that of It's an indictment on us. Is it deliberate? I don't think so. I, because in a, <laughs> Every politician from independence to today will tell you that they support culture, they support heritage. Right. And people have done some things. But there is this larger picture which nobody's seen, and that comes with reflection. That comes with not just the politicians, but the advocacy from individuals, from NGOs, from academics, from all of these different people. So it's a failure, it's a total failure along the road. It's not just, we can't just blame politicians, um, because politicians do what they think people want them to do. Right. So if people, they don't get the impression that people want an institution like a national library, you know, I remember, I think it was 1913 ele elections, uh, 20, 2013 elections, and I said, whoever mentions library, I'll vote for it. Nobody did. <laughs> I couldn't even give away my vote, <laughs> you know, because there was not a push by people to say, this is something that we need. It's important to us. So the politician just didn't mention it. We have a call on the line. Good morning, caller. You're alive. Yes, good morning, uh, Joseph, and good morning to your guest. I want to thank you for this program. Thank you very much because, as um, Dr. Martin says, we don't read, so we, we love it when people talk to us and people tell us the stories, yes? I just have an observation, though, that it seems eh, that um, we, we link... Grenada today, I don't know if I'm getting it wrong, but I'm, I find we link it to the transatlantic slave trade. Now, I'm a careful listener, and I also heard from Dr. Martin that some of our history is in France, okay? And also, we kind of gloss over, we jump over the history of the early Kalinago people who today we still do things that they have left behind. So I find sometimes we are we are um, cheating our young or school children when we go back and start from the transatlantic slave trade. Because take Karaku, for example. Even today, the, the people in Karaku, they um, worship their ancestors. Didn't that come from the Caribs? Didn't the name of the island Karaku, isn't that from the Caribs? I will leave it there and I will continue to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. Doc? Thank you. A very good question, I think, observation. Um, I agree that we don't talk enough about um, indigenous heritage. Um, we talk about them being cannibals and things like that, which this is all history. This is all stuff that we need to um, look at the new um, archaeology that's been the last 50 years of archaeology has shed quite a bit of light on um, our indigenous heritage. I say one of the things I look at, you know, uh, we, we big up Jab Jab Soka, you know, the conch shell, the lambi, in, in there, you know, that is something that comes from indigenous, you know, the whole processing of the meat, the diving for it, all of that. Um, so things like that I think we need to look at, um, indigenous heritage and how it has influenced, you know, our culture. Um, you have to recognize that, yes, things did not begin began with the first European showing up in Grenada or enslaved people being brought here. There was a, There's a history of hundreds of years, almost 2,000 years, 
of indigenous heritage in Grenada that we can go back. We have over 80-something sites on the island, um, archaeological sites and historical sites, um, where we could show indigenous heritage. So totally agree with you that we have neglected. Uh, we talk about Caribs and Arawaks, and most people are confused about what it is, that history is, and we need to do a better job in talking about the full history of the island of Grenada. And that is something I actually did for my dissertation, um, which I'm getting ready to publish in the next year, hopefully. Um, but the idea of looking at all of that, how all of that has created Grenada today. You know, that's not just slavery, it's not just this, that, or the other, but it's all of that that has created this this landscape that we, this, this Isle of Spies, that we admire and, and rejoice and celebrate, you know. We may, not, we may not necessarily appreciate everything that has happened within our, in our past, but we have to accept and acknowledge it is part of who mm -hmm. we are, mm -hmm. yeah? And really and truly, and we would agree that very often we have to be able to appreciate our past so that we can learn from it, so that we can avoid some of the mistakes mm -hmm. that, that, has, that has been made back there and then. Um, Doc? It was, a, it was a pleasure. As I said, the hour runs fast, but what we're going to do is to make this part of a constant, con a continuous conversation where we can educate our, 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 our people and who we are, hmm. you know, so that as we continue to appreciate being Grenadian as we continue to march towards our 50th anniversary of independence. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I would love to come back. Well, you, you, you will be back. <laughs> Two minutes on to the hour of 10 o'clock in the morning time. This is where we leave the conversation. And again, we want to say thanks to all of those who contributed online. Antonio and Glenda Thompson, uh, she's saying Dominique still have the mon monument of the slaves, were auctioned sitting there in the market square and next to the Calinego Museum from way back. We need to, to be more comm commemorative. We need to have more commemorative plaques around the island to show sure where the people who are part of a history exactly where they are but all good things must come to an end we had to leave the conversation here for now until another place and time jc loves you have yourself a really great one until 